happy Father's Day. And uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, there's some people in the room clapping. Uh, and that is because for the very first time we are having people here uh, on campus, uh, at our North Campus, for a live recording, people from all over Austin. Uh, and if that's something that intrigues you, you can go on our website every Monday. We'll give you an update, it's depending what's happening in the area and with the mandates. But uh, it's good to have some people in the room. But we know there's thousands of you watching online. You might be with a roommate, you might be with your family, you might be by yourself, but we're glad that you have tuned in this Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the guys who are out there. Uh, who, who have crazy kids and your life has been fun and stressful and all the things that come with that. I love being a dad so much so we, uh, we had five kids. I mean, it's how, much, how much we loved it, right? Uh, we keep having kids. And so, again, celebrate the people in your life and those around you. And, and here's something that's not in my notes uh, that I wanted to do. Every Father's Day, I also celebrate um, my grandmothers because both of my parents were raised without a father. And so for all of you single moms out there, single dads out there, uh, just know that you're not forgotten. And then some of you are having to do the job of two people. So we celebrate you. We know that you have a big job ahead of you uh, in, in the years to come. So we are in week two of our Fast and Furious series. And, and uh, again, last week was week one, and we really gave some context of the reason behind the series, which is how do we deal with anger and our impatience in a season like the rent? And, and we planned out this series months before uh, the pandemic, before everything was happening, all the upheaval, people on the streets rioting, people on the streets really wanting and seeking out justice. We just knew that we needed to hit this topic because even before these last few months, as pastors and leaders, a lot of our conversations, we're helping people walk through the anger that they're feeling, the impatience they're feeling, and the subsequent uh, actions they take because of anger and impatience. And th last week, we also talked about the reason uh, and good reasons for some of us to have righteous anger. And that righteous anger is anchored in God's desire. God's desire for us, God's desire for humanity, God's desire for justice. And how do we know the difference? So here we are in, in week two, and, and I want you to know, we want to acknowledge as a church that change is hard. And, and some of us have created some habits around our anger. Some of us have created habits around our impatience, and we just chalk it up to our personalities. Right? You do something and your kids roll your, their eyes and like, oh, that's just dad, that's just mom, that's just, just, just the way they are. Because somebody has said, it's okay, we're, we're going to allow you to be you, but really when we get to the, to the root of our lives, the root can be filled with so much anger and anxiety and impatience, and it causes us to lash out or, or to do things or to have actions that really don't line up with God's Word. We're going through First and Second Samuel uh, in, this, in this series, and, and I know that uh, if, if you really uh, haven't read a lot of Scripture, or you don't know a lot of Scripture, and you're reading along with us, there can be parts of this that seem very difficult to read. And, and so we're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks, but I want you to understand something. We're really doing this because we want to understand a few case studies. Last week we started off with the, with the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, and their first king who was Saul. And Saul was raised up from the middle of nowhere. He was raised up out of the, out of the lowest clan in all of Israel. And yet he couldn't get over his, his anger. He couldn't get over his impatience. He just couldn't get over himself. How many of you find yourself in that situation where, man, you get a really good job, but it's going really well, and then your impatience and your true colors come out, and you lash out, and you get fired, or you get demoted, and you're starting all over, and you want to blame everybody else but if this is a pattern in your life, along like, like with Saul, maybe the answer is in here. Maybe we have to take some time to ask, how angry am I? Why am I being triggered in this way? How impatient am I? And today we're going to go into who followed Saul, and that was King David. Last week was an example of some of things not to do, and this week we want to give you an example of how to live our lives. So before we jump into David's life and, and the things that we can emulate about his life, I want to give us some context, right? So I'm going to give you two kinds of things uh, to, to follow along. So if you have your phones, take notes. If you're writing down, take a bunch of notes, because this helps you understand where David's coming from. And we talk about sometimes a family of origin. And if you think about your family, you think about all the characteristics of your family. You think about the food you ate. You think about the culture in your home. You think about your place in the home, whether you were the oldest or the youngest. Uh, I'm all for the oldest in the family. 
because, uh, you know, I know we're our parents' guinea pigs, but uh, we, we are resilient because of it. And then our youngest siblings, they just get spoiled. It's not fair. I get it. But you know what? We, we, we do better in life anyway. So we'll just leave it at that. Uh, some of you booed me, and that's fine too. That must mean you're the youngest child. Uh, so here we go. Uh, David was raised to be a shepherd. So he was raised to be very blue collar. He was going to be outside. He was going to be with sheep. He not only was with the sheep, but he cared for the sheep and he was over other shepherds. So he grew in leadership even as a shepherd. Uh, David, here we go, was the youngest in his family. Now, that's horrible pecking order when it comes to ancient times. Because in ancient times, people like me, who were the oldest, were the ones who got the bigger blessing. They were the ones the parents looked at to kind of lead the family moving forward. So if you were the youngest, it was like, eh, you know, we already have seven or eight kids. Why don't you just go feed the sheep, right? And the older kids were, were, were adorned, and they were, uh, they were adored, and, and they were just given the most, and that's the way it worked in historic times. So David didn't have— the best pecking order. He was the youngest in his family. Uh, David was a musician. He played the harp. I, sometimes I wish I was a musician. I mean, there are times I watch these guys lead in worship, and I'm like, if I could play guitar and play the piano and sing like that, I don't know if I would ever leave my house and just sing all day long. I would be the starving artist, right? Because I, I wish I could play music. I love listening to it. But David played the harp, and he was so good at it which means he put time and was disciplined, that he got called up to serve in the king's court. So here we're going to go to first name of verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And here's what happens is Saul is looking for somebody to bring comfort to him. And here's what happens, verse 17. So Saul said to his attendants, those working for him, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. Because why would you hire somebody who doesn't play well, right? Uh, one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. So what are some attributes we pick up just from these two verses? He had a good reputation. I mean, how many of you in the neighborhood you grew up with had, had, had a good reputation? I mean, some of you babysat. So all the, the ladies in the neighborhood who were moms would hire you to babysit their children because you had a good reputation. And then others of you, the neighbors wouldn't even let you watch their dogs because you didn't have a good reputation growing up. And that's okay, but that's, he had a good reputation. He was brave. He fought off bears. He fought a giant. He was a warrior. He was well-spoken. He was good looking. Now, I don't know what that has to do with anything that he was good looking, but for some reason it says it in Scripture. It points it out that he was good looking. He was attractive, not just in his attributes and what he could do, but his countenance was good looking. He had favor from God, and he had passionate humility. Well, how do we know he had passionate humility? Because when King Saul offered him a reward for killing the giant, he said, I'm going to give you my daughter. Now, that's another sermon for another time, okay? I'm not going to talk about, did he have the right to give his daughter away? It was ancient times. That's a different message. But he said, I'm going to give you my daughter. And you know what David said when the time came to become the king's son-in-law? He said this in verse 19. And David replied to Saul, who am I? And what is my family or my clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? And most of us, if we had an opportunity to move up in the world, to be part of the king's court, we would have taken it. But David's humility kept him from things he didn't feel he deserved. So there's some characteristics about David. Now let's get some context, some history of David's timeline. First one is, he was ignored by his father. Isn't that a great one? And some of you kind of understand that. He was ignored by his father. Maybe some of you didn't even have a father growing up. And so to, today, like today, can be really difficult. Because everybody's celebrating these dads, and they're going to post on social media pictures with their dad or pictures with their kids. And inside, you're struggling because maybe you didn't have a father, or maybe you didn't have a good example of a father. But David had a father and was ignored by him. How do we know that? Because when Samuel came to his father's house to pick the new king, David wasn't even invited to the party. Listen, I, I don't care if I get invited to parties or not, 
But you know what the worst thing is? To be invited to a party and then disinvited to a party. That's the worst thing. Or to know that everybody you know is there in the house. Someone of, of your clan is going to be anointed king and you're asked to go be outside cleaning up. That's why I love all of our volunteers at all of our campuses. When our campuses open back up, it's one of the things I can't wait to see. I know our campus pastors can't wait to see is all the people who make it happen. Just for this live recording with a couple of hundred people, there were so many people volunteering, willing to say, I will be outside, greeting, doing my part so that other people can come in and experience worship inside the building. And that was David's heart. He was ignored by his father, but he did it with all that he had. And then he was invited into the house and he was set apart by the prophet Samuel. He was a hero to a nation on multiple occasions. He saved the country because he was a warrior. He served the king in battle, and he served the king by being a calming figure, by being that musician in the king's court. He was loved by the king's family. The king's son, Jonathan, was his best friend, and the king's daughter, Michael, was in love with him. I mean, this guy had so much favor. He had so much going for him. But then he was hunted down by his father-in-law. Now, I know some of us might have father-in-law issues. Do not raise your hand. Don't say anything at home right now. Your wife or your husband will kill you right now, okay? Don't say anything about your father-in-law. But inside, you're like, gosh, my father-in-law. Or we won't even, I'll go there. Your mother-in-law, right? Some of us have in-law issues, but how many of you have been hunted down to be killed by your father-in-law? David was. He lived in enemy territory for years. He had to go to the enemy's camp to hide to save his life. And so he was literally fighting for his life. And then it ended up, he took over a throne. He finally became king, but he became king over a kingdom in shambles because Saul had defaced the, the, the throne of Israel. So here you have this guy with all these characteristics, all these talents, this storyline. He had a bright future, and yet the reality of his life wasn't really coming to pass. I mean, you would think somebody looks at you and says, you're going to be the next CEO. You're going to get that promotion, and you're going to get this, and I'm going to invest in your company, and you're going to have a child, or whatever your dream might be, and then right as you see it right in front of you, it begins to look like a longer journey than you anticipated. And David was facing his 20s. He was a really young man. With all this family of origin stuff, running from his life, and he was in his 20s, and yet in his 20s, he set an example for us of how to deal with your anger and impatience. And all I'm glad is that there wasn't cell phones when I was a kid, as an angry kid, or I might not be a pastor today, right? Because somebody would be able to see all the things I did. Can you imagine? For those of you who are, let's say, over 35 years old, if there was a cell phones back in the day watching everything you did, if there was Facebook, if there was Twitter, if there was Instagram watching everything you did, and yet David had his life chronicled, all the good and all of the bad. So he's facing adulthood. He's going into becoming a man and he begins to model for us how to deal with the frustration. That gap between the reality of where I am and where I hope to be. And that gap, the bigger it grows, the more frustration and anger and impatience we can have. And it's where we're at in our culture today. I, I'm going to say it. I, I would hope you believe it. I hope it, wouldn't, it would be a no-brainer for us. But racism is a sin. There's no getting around it. But some people know where the reality of where we are in our country, and yet the gap to where we want to be. And for some people, that gap is bigger than others, and it breeds frustration and anger. And David is anointed king. He has oil poured all over him. He's told, you're going to be the next one. And he kills a giant. He's promised a family. He's promised a bright future. And yet... None of it is coming to pass, and instead, he's fighting for his life. And what does he do? He models for us, thousands of years later, how to deal with our anger, our impatience, our frustration, 
of the gap we face in our lives. What's the first thing he did? David grew with adversity. David grew as a man. David grew as a future king. David grew as a father when he was facing adversity. David's predecessor, Saul, he shrunk back when he faced adversity. When he faced things that were coming against his desires and his his dreams, he shrunk back. He grew in fear. He didn't grow forward. He went backwards. That's why he lost the throne. But David grew. And how do we know he grew? He grew more resilient. Now he didn't, he had moments I mean, if you read the Psalms in Scripture, there are moments where David's being honest about how he feels. God, are you even with me? God, are you even here? And if you read some of the Psalms in Scripture, it can almost seem like David is a little bit all over the place emotionally in his mental health. Because in one passage, he's like, God, where are you? You've left me here to die. And the next one, he's like, God, you're the greatest. You're going to bring me through this. And how many of us have had that roller coaster ride of emotions just the last few months? much less for years. But he was resilient. I was 22 years old, and I heard this pastor who was like 80 years old, and he stood up in front of a bunch of young pastors, and he said this, it's okay to want to quit. And I remember the whole room got really quiet. It was like, nobody ever told me you can quit. You're not allowed to be a quitter in life. But this 80-year-old man was looking at a bunch of 20-something-year-old pastors saying, it's okay to quit. It's okay to want to quit. But you know what you do? You go to bed saying, I'm done. And you get up the next morning, and you wake up, and you get back at it again. Because our anger, our impatience, our frustration can be an emotion. And it's a powerful emotion. But if we give into it, it can ruin the plans that we have worked towards. But if we grow resilient and begin to push past it, would be like David, and he also grew more in favor with those closest to him. You see, as David began to live righteously and do the right things, it made an impact in the people around him. It made a difference in the people around him. So he grew in favor with those people because they saw him being resilient, they saw him growing, and they wanted to be around him more. He was more reliant on God as he grew. How do we know that? Just go read Psalms. He wrote these love letters to God. He grew in his relationship with God. We sang it today, run to the Father. He ran to the Father over and over and over again. He grew more in patience, and he grew more as a family man. We're going to read this scripture from 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. And it says this, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. And David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Ask yourself this question. When I'm facing adversity, is my goal to grow through the situation, or is my goal to find an excuse to not be everything I'm supposed to be because of the situation? So we can look at David and see that he was the king, man after God's own heart. He had everything going for him. He had, he had, had all these things. But sometimes we have to see the life and the journey of a person to really understand them. One of my favorite researchers, her name is Angela Duckworth, she writes about grit. She's a PhD, she's an Ivy League professor at Penn, and she says this, nobody wants to show you the hours and hours of becoming. They'd rather show you the highlight of what they've become. I was walking my kids through my story, and I, and I just really quickly said, you know, when I was a teenager, I went to jail a few times, and, and I just kind of went off with, on with the story. We went to church that next day, and my little girl, she was like six years old, and she went in telling everybody in the church, my dad went to jail, my dad went to jail, and I'm like, yeah, not this weekend, everybody, not this weekend. It was when I was a teenager, because I wanted my kids to know the adversity that we face, and how did I learn that? How did I know that? Because I fortunately had a dad and a mom who shared their stories. And one of those stories is the story of my uncle, Javier Cavazos. Everybody calls him Bob because Javier is really hard for people to say. And he was born in El Valle, the valley of Texas. And, and my, my, my parents and, the, and my mom's side, they were migrant workers. So he grew up as a migrant worker. 
And as a migrant worker, he, all he knew was that at 5 a.m. he was going to be out in the fields working until his dad said he could go to school. And there were days he wasn't allowed to go to school because they had to provide for their family. He lost his dad by grandfather when he was a teenager. And they used to travel up and down the Midwest just finding farms to work because we were not allergic to work. We were going to work. We were going to provide for our families. That's, that's kind of the family mantra. You're going to work. We're going to do whatever it takes. They landed in, in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. And my uncle, who had all this adversity, could have said, I'm just going to be a victim of my circumstances. But you know what he did instead? He found an outlet. He found a passion. He found a gift he had. And you know what he did? He took basketballs and baseballs, and he put them in the hands of kids who were working on farms, kids who were living in the slums, kids who were living in ghettos, kids who were living a life that he knew as a child. And he was getting them on basketball courts, getting them on baseball diamonds. And then it grew where he was getting kids from the suburbs. And then it grew where he was getting boys and he was helping girls. And now he has this organization called CASA, C-A-Y-S-A. And all he does for his entire life is help these young people get off the streets, learn, a tr learn, a, learn the game that he loved, and now hundreds of those kids went on to college, got their educations. Because he wanted somebody to believe in him, so he turned around and he believed in the city, and he believed in the next generation. And I, I, I got the honor of, of playing for my uncle. It wasn't fun. He was awful. He was mean. He was opinionated. He was loud. He would cuss us out. Because when we were younger, that was okay. But we won. And he would take misfits and he would grow us into men. And he would shape us. Even though nobody did that for him. Even though he lost his father. Even though he was a marginalized people group in our country. He was one of those people. He was one of the other. He eventually grew in to impacting an entire city of white kids and black kids and brown kids and Asian kids and girls and boys. And how did he do that? Because he was resilient, because he didn't let the circumstance dictate who he was. So much that a few years ago, I was super proud when John Smoltz went in the Hall of Fame, baseball player, pitcher for the Atlanta Braves. He mentioned his whole family, and then he mentioned three people who impacted his life. And my uncle was number two. Hall of Fame speech. And he mentions my uncle. See, my, my, my uncle didn't do what he did to get people in the Hall of Fame, although he has two former students in the Hall of Fame. John Smoltz and Irvin Magic Johnson. But you know what he's proud about? He's proud about looking at those kids who don't have a father and saying, you're my son. And you know what's humbling about that? Is that on this Father's Day, I know you're watching, Uncle Bob. My uncle doesn't even have children of his own. But he took on the children of a city. Why? Because you got to grow in the middle of your impatience, in the middle of your anger. And if you fight through it, you can make a difference beyond what you even know for generations to come. you got to grow with adversity. Number two, David was unashamed of his God. And this is hard for me because, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I kind of like, I like the optics. How do things look? But David was unashamed. He fought Goliath because he was unashamed of his God. He said, who is that giant that's saying things about our God? So out of his righteous anger, anchored in God, he fought for his country. And then... There was a time where he danced before the entire country, disrobing himself, worshiping God with all that he had. Now, I don't know what your background is in church. Maybe this is the first time you're even watching a church service. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you grew up Baptist. Maybe you grew up Catholic or Methodist or Episcopalian. Or God forbid, like me, you grew up Pentecostal with all the weirdos, okay? I don't know how you grew up. But for me, this is normal. As a Pentecostal kid, there are people running around. There were flags. You might, well, why do people have flags? You just have to experience it. Just experience it one time, right? And people are jumping up and down. Their hands are raised, and they're dancing. And it was, it was it, looking back, it was awesome because people were unashamed to own that they loved God. And this is what we find in David. He's dancing before a country, unashamed of his, his love for God, and his wife, 
looks at him and says, David, that is not very distinguished of you. You're supposed to be the king. You're supposed to have a demeanor. You're supposed to have a way about you. Stoic and boring. Who would want to be a king like that? I mean, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, matter of fact, after last week's message, my wife, you know, she always gives me feedback, what was good, what wasn't good. She goes, oh, babe, this and this and this and this. She goes, but can you just calm down a little bit? <laughs> I'm like, why? She goes, I, I'm nervous for you. People are going to think you're just spazzing out. I'm like, I, I kind of am spazzing out a little bit, right? And that's, that was the king's, king's wife. Get a grip, David. You're embarrassing me. You ever told your husband that while he's chasing your kids in Target on the floor? <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those dads. I hide in the clothes with my kids. <laughs> Babe, I bet you can't find me. And my wife's like, I am walking the other direction. Unashamed. But David, he had no shame. And here's what he says to his wife in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 21. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. Now that was a little bit of a diss, right? She probably shouldn't have said that, right? Who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord and I will become even more undignified than this. <laughs> you ever told your wife or your husband that? Oh, you don't want me to do that? You don't want me to do that? Watch this. That was David. You don't want me to worship God? Well, I'm going to go crazy. See, for all the talent and all the outward gifts that David had, he found his source in the strength of God. One of my best friends went to go work for another friend of mine who's a businessman in Dallas. And uh, my best friend's name, uh, in college, his name is Chad. And Chad went to SMU, got his master's degree, real kind of formal guy. And he went to go work for another one of our friends who's very informal. And our other friend, John, kind of grew up with nothing and he grew this incredible business. And so now our friend, uh, he's going to be the, the CFO for his company. So about a year in, I tell my friend, oh, what's it like working for John? He's like, it's embarrassing. What do you mean embarrassing? Your company's growing. There's millions of dollars. What's embarrassing that you work for him? She goes, no, you should see our business meetings when we go meet with banks. I'm like, what does that go? How does that go? He goes, well, I come in with all my paperwork. He's got an accounting background. I come with all my paperwork, and here's why we should partner together for this, for this project, and I know this millions of dollars. And John, our friend who's a little crazy, who's the CEO of the company, you know what he does? He says, I don't care about all that. God told me you're going to give me the money as a bank, and then we're going to go do this. And Chad said he was so embarrassed the first time. And you know what he said, though? We've never been turned down. Because our friend John knew he had nothing. So what he did have wasn't his anyway. He was unashamed that God gave him the dream for the company. That God helped him grow the company. And he, he's never lost his love for the one who called him. Unashamed. David grew in adversity. Was unashamed of his relationship with God. And then number three, re revenge was never an option. We're going to read from two chapters. 1 Samuel 24 and 26. And in a scene right out of a movie, David's running for his life, and he's with his men of valor, and he finds himself hiding in a cave because Saul is nearby and is about to kill him when he finds him. And when he's in the cave, guess what happens? I mean, it's kind of a comedy, right? It's like a black comedy, actually. It's like, really, like, can you imagine that you are in a cave, and you're hiding for your life, and all of a sudden, the guy who's looking for you comes into the same cave that you're in? and he goes to the bathroom. It's in, it's in scripture. I'm not making this up. He's, in the, he's going to the bathroom in the cave, and David's men tell him, kill him! He's vulnerable! This is your chance! Take him out! We can take over the kingdom! We can move forward! And you know what David does in that moment? He rebukes his men, and even in that moment where he could have taken revenge, he's still setting the standard for those around him. And here's what happens. Saul walks out of the cave, and David follows him. He exposes himself out in the dark to Saul. And he says this, 1 Samuel 24. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. He had cut off a piece of his robe while he was in the cave, relieving himself. 
I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand, the Lord can avenge you, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Can you imagine? He's confronting his father-in-law saying, you deserve the worst, but I'm not going to bring it. I'm going to hold my emotions. I'm going to hold my impatience. I'm going to hold my anger together because God is the righteous judge. But this is proof, this piece of robe in my hand is proof that I could have taken revenge. Saul responds in verse 16 by asking him a question. He says, is that your voice, David, my son? And Saul wept out loud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. How good would that feel if your in-laws just came and asked you for forgiveness? That's not what he was looking for. He wasn't looking to feel good. David wanted freedom. And then Saul continues, You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. No revenge. And when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me. My dad used to always tell me, I am doing what I do, son, so that you can be better than me. I want you to be better than me. And that's what Saul's acknowledging. You, David, in this moment are better than me. You're better than I am. Because revenge was not on his radar. Now, I wish I could say that everything David did was great. That everything David did was a great example for us, but it's not the case. Because the truth is there were seasons where David messed up. There were seasons where David did not do what he was supposed to do. That David was not in the place he was supposed to be. Matter of fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David is supposed to go to war because that's what kings do. And scripture tells us in the time of war, when kings go to war, David didn't go to war and he stayed home. And out of his laziness and out of his power struggle, he stayed home and he found himself wanting another woman, Bathsheba, who belonged to another man, another family, Uriah. And he wooed Bathsheba and he slept with her. She became pregnant, and to try to cover up his tracks, he called for Uriah to come back from war. I mean, can you imagine what this is like? This guy who's after God's own heart, who did so much that was righteous, but when he let his guard down, when he didn't live the way he was supposed to live, he slept with another man's wife, and to cover up his tracks, called for the man to come back. And Uriah, being righteous, He said, I'm not going to go home because my men are on the front lines and they can't see their wives. And David got him drunk one night and tried to send him home so he could be with his wife to once again cover up his mistakes. And Uriah didn't do it. So now you have a situation where David goes to his lowest low. And here's what he does. He sends a letter to his right-hand official. And he sends it with Uriah, the man that he stole his wife from. And in the letter that Uriah is carrying, the letter says to Joab, put Uriah in a position where basically he will die soon. Put him in the worst spot in the army so he can die, so David could cover up his tracks. Joab does it, Uriah dies. And here's how David is in his anger and his impatience and his mistakes. He has no remorse. He says this in 2 Samuel verse 25 of chapter 11. Say this to Joab after Uriah dies. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Please press the attack against the city and destroy it. And say this to encourage Joab. You know what he's telling to Joab? Eh, people die. This man with a sensitive heart who worshiped God killed another man and tried to comfort another man by saying it's not that big a deal. 
David wasn't perfect. He made a ton of mistakes. He, he couldn't handle himself. And then he finally gets confronted by the prophet Nathan. In 2 Samuel verse 12, verse 7 through 9. He's confronted with a story of a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man has all these animals and the poor man only has one lamb. And the rich man takes the one lamb from the poor man because he doesn't want to kill any of his own animals for a feast. So he robs the poor man of the only thing he has, even though the rich man has everything. And Nathan begins to tell this parable. And David gets upset. His righteous anger says, let's kill the rich man and let's replenish to the poor man everything the rich man stole. And then Nathan the prophet drops this bomb on him in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? David had gone from being righteous to living a double standard because of his impatience and because of his anger and his emotions. And when this happened, you know what David did? He didn't do what Saul did and try to defend himself. He repented. He lamented. He was full of sorrow. He owned his sin. He acknowledged his evil ways. Why? Because the fourth thing we can learn from David, even when he makes mistakes, even in his sin, even when he doesn't do what's right, the fourth thing we can learn about David is this. He was anchored in humility. And I wonder how many of us in this season of life are anchored to humility. It didn't mean he was fully humble. It didn't mean he did everything right. What it did mean was this, that even when he was wrong, he would acknowledge it. I know many of us are having to acknowledge a lot of things in this season of our life. And if we are having a hard time acknowledging our wrongs, then maybe we should check our hearts for a lack of humility. Because even when David was wrong, and even when he killed a man, and even when he took another family, and even when he lied, and even when he stole, when he was confronted, he was anchored back to humility because of his love for God. Well, how many of us have been prideful? How many of us are trying to hold on for the things of today? Listen, there's pandemics and racism and politics and fear and the economy. All of these things can bring, can bring pride. What about me? What about me? What about me? But what if we grew in this season? And what if we were God-centered because God is with us? And, and what if we walked in justice and not revenge? And what if we were anchored in humility? What if we could learn from David what to do when anger and impatience try, tries to creep in? That's our challenge today. Can we grow? Can we grow in God? Can we not take revenge and walk in justice? And can we be anchored in humility? Let's pray today. God, thank you that we get to do this. That we get to watch online with our family and friends and roommates or maybe even by ourselves. That we get to come to a live taping of today's service. That we get to worship together. That we get to read your scripture. But Lord, it would all be for naught if we don't learn from this message that you are with us and that you're going before us. God, be with us as we check our hearts, as we check our motives, and as we surrender to you. In Jesus' name.